You know, as we get older, not that I have any experience in that yet, but as we get older, our feelings about the things that we love and that we hate become that much more entrenched. And I feel truly blessed that there's a healthy imbalance between the things that I love and that, what I, that which I hate. But I have learned something about myself, and that is that I hate waste. They ask my wife or kids, I'm running around the house, picking up every little piece of paper, every little piece of cardboard. Anytime my daughter leaves a shampoo bottle in the trash can, I'm on. I become a recycling maniac. And that hate for waste has transferred into my practice, into the advice that I give companies. And so this hate for waste, I want to share with you. I think, I think we've made the message clear now, yeah. But what I'm really here to talk about, what I really want you to take away from this session, is the waste that takes place in the context of innovation, of innovation, of the intangible assets that we discard and misdeploy and don't fully utilize. We are in the midst of recovering from one of the worst global recessions in our history. Board members and leaders of companies are under the attack of activist shareholders and Wall Street pundits and other analysts. Where can we find growth? Where can we drive shareholder value? It's sitting right under our nose. Now, there's no good report on this, so you'll just have to trust me, but varying numbers are between $10 trillion and $30 trillion worth of intangible assets rotting on the proverbial vine. $10 trillion to $30 trillion. And by the way, they're rotting on the vine inside institutions like universities, government labs, large and mid-sized corporations, even foundations and not-for-profits. It's incredible to me that we have this strategic disconnect. How could it be? How could we be struggling, political parties fighting for new ways to stimulate the economy and to foster more entrepreneurship and creativity and innovation and have $30 trillion worth of things ignored, unaddressed? We spent last year, again, I might be off by a billion or two, $160 billion in government-driven and um, corporate-driven R&D. Uh, I'm sorry, university-driven and, uh, and uh, government-driven R&D. What do you think the average return is on investment? What do you think the typical, and this is from the Association of University Technology Managers, Autumn, and these are the people closest to the data. The average university royalty rate is under 1%. So let me get this straight. Your name is? Mike. Mike. I would like uh, to get $100 billion from you, if possible. Did you bring a check today? Maybe. Negative. All right. No, certainly not for $100 billion. Um, I will be providing to you under a billion dollars in return. How's that sound, Mike? really good, yeah? Right? And I'll throw in a drum set. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I mean, you know, getting two knives maybe. I mean, we can do better, can't we? I mean, it starts right here. And it starts with an approach of actually mimicking principles of recycling and principles of the agrarian economy. We need to think of ourselves as it, entrepreneurial environmentalists and intellectual capital agrarians. And every single person in this room and every single person watching this, whether it's today or in the future, is capable of contributing to reversing this trend. We all are. We all see it every day. And we are able to do better. I mean, better than 1% return, for sure. So, you know, the old adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure, it is. It's just a matter of perspective you know, to look at these assets as drivers of shareholder value, to look at these assets as a way to drive business growth, particularly for entrepreneurial companies, because this is the ultimate capital efficient strategy. Why? Because the thing already exists. The, the, the fruit is on the vine, ready to pick. But like an agrarian, we have to pick it with a sense of urgency. 
We have to pick it and bring it to the marketplace quickly before it rots. And here's the, one of the big takeaways I want you to learn today. You don't have to be the one that plants the seed as long as you're the one who brings its harvest to the marketplace. A couple of examples. Howard Schultz, Starbucks. Think Howard invented coffee? No, <laughs> he did not. What he did do is make us all want to drink more of it and feel good about walking around with a $6 cup of latte and feeling smart about it. Now, I could do that again, but that would be twerking, and I don't want to <laughs> promise my family I wouldn't do that today. And I do follow the rules. So. <laughs> Uh, Ray Kroc didn't exactly invent the cheeseburger. In fact, he wasn't even the founder of McDonald's. He was a milkshake salesman, a milkshake machine salesman to McDonald's. But he saw potential. He didn't plant the seed. He brought the seed to the marketplace. Oh, and built a global empire along the way. All right? More example, Tom Monahan from Domino's. Certainly not invent the pizza. He just made it a lot easier for all of us to order pizzas brought the harvest to the marketplace. Federal Express, I mean, we had mail. <laughs> we even had UPS. But Fred Smith, who got a C on his paper, so those of you grading papers in this room, pay careful attention, figured out a way to revolutionize the packaging industry. These are intellectual capital agrarians. These are entrepreneurial environmentalists taking something that already exists and making it better, reusing it, repurposing it, improving it, being captains of innovation. Hundreds of billions of dollars later, all these companies are still thriving. Now, every company has a donut hole. You all have a donut hole, personally, professionally, as a company. What is the thing inside your company right now that's either being misdeployed, ignored, or even thrown away? One of the greatest visionaries in this area, Lou Gerstner from IBM. Lou comes along, looks at the business model of the company, says, let me get this straight. Let's just go over this one more time. We are selling low margin hardware and giving away services. Is that right? Yep, no, that's right, that's our business model. How about if we gave away the hardware and sold the services? Oh no, we can't do that. A couple of years later, one of the biggest consulting companies in the world. All right? What's your company's donut hole? We had a great story yesterday. State senator from Wisconsin, those of you that know Wisconsin, decides to gather the local cheese producers together to save the curds and the rinds because it actually creates amazing traction in the winter, holding tires to the road in snow and icy conditions. What a great donut hole. Look, if state senators can come up with these ideas, <laughs> we certainly can. <laughs> Again, we don't have to be the person who planted the seed to be the one who brings the harvest to the marketplace. And so the book that I wrote, Harvesting Intangible Assets, was looking at our evolution as a society, from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy, and now to an information and intangible asset-driven economy. That evolution is complete. It's not going to reverse itself. We are not going back to being a manufacturing society. We're, we're there. But the principles of agrarianism, the principles of farming, still apply. All of us, we plant our seeds, we protect our seeds against the adversities of deers who want to eat our corn and weather that wants to destroy our crops while they're still young and too fragile to protect themselves. And then at the right time, we have to bring those crops to the marketplace on a timely basis with a sense of urgency because any good farmer knows you wait even an extra couple days, you just worked all year and get nothing. Why can't we bring that same sense of agrarian urgency inside companies? 
Why can't we all go to work? You don't have to wear the overalls. Why can't we all go to work with that agrarian mindset, looking for new seeds to plant, or seeds that other people have planted? Licensing in, licensing out, joint ventures, uh, strategic alliances, business format franchising, all strategies available to be better harvesters of intangible capital. You want more proof? I got proof. I got all kinds of proof, right? It's my legal training. I came from lots of evidence. Look at this transformation. I mean, look at this. In every single industry, if you go back to 1975, around the time of my bar mitzvah, a date that I know all of you mark on your calendars and its anniversary, but around approximately the time of my bar mitzvah, forward, look at the transformation. I mean, look at some of these industries. Financial services and banking was barely 1%. And what's so ironic is actually financial service and banking was the first business model patent ever approved for State Street. Industries have completely transformed themselves. Balance sheets have been turned on their heads. Look at this ratio. I mean, back when I first started practicing law, if we did an M&A deal that was mostly plant and equipment and real estate and inventory, and then there was that last couple of points of value that we couldn't figure out what bucket to put it in, we threw it in the bucket known as, Mike, goodwill. Goodwill. Made sense. I mean, I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? I don't know. You know, that brand thing, that relationship thing, that culture, all the stuff that doesn't show up in Gap. Let's just throw it in goodwill. But I don't think we can do that anymore. Not at 88.12. I mean, and does anybody in this room Think this trend is going to magically reverse itself? We're going to suddenly start having S&P 500 balance sheets just fraught with tangible assets? And by the way, when it comes to small companies, this ratio is even more out of skew. Because the average entrepreneurial company is probably 90-95% intangibles. And if you're really interested in this topic, I highly recommend the work of Professor Baruch Lev out of, out of New York, NYU. This guy has written for the last 30 years about how gap around intangible assets is basically extinct. The notion of goodwill has got to be redefined. And I agree with him. Let's look at some more proof. Anybody heard of that first company? Yeah. About 330, 340 billion in market cap. Maybe a touch less because we've had two negative days on the Dow. But still. Let's just say north of 300 billion. Shall we round off their market cap? How many intangible assets could they possibly have? 1%? Two, I mean, how many servers can you buy? Even Google. Nine, let's, let's just assume $9 billion worth of servers. That's a lot of servers. Still only 3%. Processes, system, know how, relationships, channels, brand loyalty, customer experience. I mean, these are the assets of the new economy. And yet, less than 1% of companies surveyed felt they had an effective IAM system in place, intangible asset management system. Mike, I bet if you sold widgets, and I came to you as a widget maker, you would know exactly how many widgets you had online, you how many are in the pipeline, how many widgets are being returned, how many widgets are sitting in inventory. But we don't sell widgets anymore. We sell intangibles. And we have, we have no good system for managing those intangibles. How could that be? How can we, in a post-Sarbanes-Oxley world, when we're supposed to be driving and protecting shareholder value, mismanage 97 or 98 percent of the essential intrinsic market cap of the company? We can do better. So we need to be environmental, entrepreneurial environmentalists and intellectual asset agrarians. We need to commit to knowing more about this, managing it better, understanding it better, not allowing these assets to rot on the proverbial vine, bringing the same discipline to them that a farmer would to its crops. So, yeah, I do hate waste. And I want you to look at this pile of trash differently, as if it's opportunity, as if it's all of our future, because it is. And I want you to join me 
in this commitment to recycle, to reuse, to repurpose, to, to enter into the ultimate capital efficient strategy. I mean, what better driver of business growth, of shareholder value, is there to make more use of something that already exists? How much better could that be? So I hate waste, and I think you should too. Thank you. <laughs>